before we start, let's pray. We can do nothing without God. Amen. Jesus, we need you. We thank you for each one that's here and for those who are on the road. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bless this idea fest. We know, Lord Jesus, without you we could do absolutely nothing. We want you to touch everything said and done. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I had the privilege to live a couple of years in England. And uh, in the breaks in England, they love to play darts. Anybody here ever play darts? I've got a few few dart players. Who's, who's pretty good at darts? This sister right there in the pink, she, I don't know her, but she raised her hand and said she's pretty good, so that's good. Come up here, would you, sister? Amen. And uh, by the way, while she's coming, say hello to somebody near you that you don't know, would you? All right. This is Sister McDaniel. And where are you from, Sister McDaniel? Bradenton. Sister McDaniel, uh, I think that's not too far away for you, is it? Let's show them, show them how you play darts, would you? Well, that's a... Ah, she hit the target. Good. Give her a hand. Thank you. Now, uh, that uh, is really not the kind of darts that they use in, in England. They, they really use these, not the felt tip, but they use, they use these, these sharp ones. And uh, so I'll just, uh, what really fascinated me when, you know, is, is when a person can put a bag over their head, you know, and then spin them around until they're dizzy. You know, just spin them around. And when it gets so, you know, wobbly and dizzy, and go around again and, and, and again and, and, uh, and, uh. <laughs> Well, what's the chance of me hitting the target? Pretty, pretty slim, isn't it? So if you don't aim, you're not going to hit the target, are you? So, now, if you don't know what the target is, it's even harder yet. But we're going to be talking about aims and objectives in teaching. Now, I might just mention to you that all facets of life have aims and objectives. For example, in sports, a runner has a finish line. A uh, mountain climber has a certain mo mountain that he's going to climb. Must be, a must, must be a storm on that mountain, but he still keeps going, right? And uh, archers have targets. Hunters have you know, animals to hit. Uh, soccer players, of course, don't just kick the ball. There's a goal. Likewise, hockey players get goals to go in. Basketball players don't just throw the ball up. They've got to go. Their aim and objective is put it through the hoop. Uh, even, uh, you know, b boxers and, and uh, wrestlers and football players and so forth. But my, uh, my favorite uh, sport now is, uh, is golf. And that's a, you have an aim and objective in golf. And the uh, objective is, is to get it in the hole with as few a strokes as possible. Now, actually, when you see this uh, course here, really the objective is to hit the ball from the tee into the hole. Now, how many have ever done that with one stroke? What's that called? A hole in one, right? And the brother back there, is it Brother Eason? You've made a hole in one. Ah, congratulate him. And I, I actually did once too, only once. And I, people, uh, you know, when they see me playing golf, I, they sometimes think, you know, I played pretty well, they think. And then they say, how long have you been playing? I said, well, 58 years. Then they don't think I play very well. They think I ought to be playing better by now. Anyways, uh, so uh, teaching is somewhat, is somewhat like this because we don't always hit it in the hole with one stroke, but we keep stroking at it. And also, we don't use always the same club every time. You know, we might hit a driver off the tee, but we're going to hit the sand wedge when we get into a sand trap like, like this here. So uh, there are obstacles. And in teaching, sometimes there are some obstacles. And, uh, you, you know, uh, you want to get in the hole. Now, you really wish, you know, I would score much better if the holes were this big. You know, I really would. I, I'd have a lot less strokes. And also, I would do better if the holes were this short. 
You know, I'd make a hole in one. Most of the time, I'd make eight out of ten of them this length for, for sure. Okay, but there's an objective, isn't there? There's definitely an objective. And I'm going to be talking about aims and objectives in teaching. The first question I have is, why are you teaching? Well, what's your motivation? Are you teaching for money? Well, if you're teaching for money, I think you're going to be sadly disappointed. Really. Uh, even if you go into Christian school teaching. Uh, I remember uh, I got the Holy Ghost when I was a sophomore in college, and it wasn't long after I got the Holy Ghost they put me in a children's church to teach, and then, and then you know, they put me in a Sunday school class to teach. And, and I remember one Christmas, Brother Spencer, my pastor, he handed every one of us, at a kind of a service before Christmas, he handed every one of our Sunday school teachers, he handed us a little envelope with a $5 bill in it. And I was stunned because I wasn't teaching for money. In fact, you know, I, I had that envelope in my drawer for years. I didn't even, you know, hardly know how to spend it because I wasn't expecting it. So uh, I doubt whether you're in it for money. I doubt really whether you're in it for fame. I don't think that many of you, they've been writing you up in your new local newspaper that you're a faithful Sunday school teacher. I doubt that. Uh, you, you know, I doubt really whether you're teaching to get the applause, you know, even of the students or the parents, because sometimes that's kind of few too. So uh, that's not really what I'm asking about. I'm not asking about your motive for teaching. What I want to ask about really is, what are you trying to accomplish? In other words, what are the students to learn? What do they know as a result of your teaching? You know, what, what did you accomplish the last time you taught? What was your goal? What was your objective? Now, uh, teaching without aims, somebody has said, is like a man starting on a vacation without knowing where, where he's going. Now, we flew in here from San Diego yesterday, but suppose that I had, would have met, met a, a friend at the airport, and they'd say, hey, Brother Mopo, where are you going? And I'd say, I haven't got the slightest idea, but I really want to get out of here. Well, that would be pretty sad, wouldn't it? I might even tell them, I've even got wheels on my suitcase. I'm high tech. You know, well, you'd have a pretty crummy vacation if you didn't know where you were going. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Well, if you uh, didn't know where you're going, you wouldn't know whether you were going to fly. You wouldn't know whether you were going to take a train. You wouldn't know, uh, you know uh, whether you were going to uh, uh, take a ship or what. And you wouldn't even know if you didn't know what you're going. You wouldn't even know if you got there because you wouldn't know where you're going. And you wouldn't know what kind of clothes to bring. I mean, is it a, uh, you know, a sporting type thing? Are you going to be uh, going to church? Uh, you know, are you going to be horseback riding? Uh, what is it? You wouldn't know what to bring. You wouldn't know what kind of equipment to bring. You know, if you didn't know whether you're going to be teaching, you're going to be fishing, going to be scuba diving, going to be golfing. And, and, and another thing, if you didn't know where you're going, you wouldn't know how much it cost. You know, there are some motels that would empty your wallet the very first, you know, the very first night you stayed. You might run out of, of money. So uh, it would be a miserable vacation. Somebody else said teaching with aims is like a carpenter who's building a house without a blueprint. Can you imagine seeing a guy and he's uh, just sawing wood like... Wow, he re he really would have a hard time. He doesn't even have, he doesn't even have good tools. I'll tell you, I can't on the airplane can't bring real good stuff. But boy, that really was sad, wasn't it? All right, well we'll try sewing anyways. You know, teachers are determined, aren't they? <laughs> They'd chew it through if they needed to to get it done. But could you imagine asking that builder, well, what you building? And he'd say, I haven't got the slightest idea, but I sure can saw straight. 
And if you'd get me a better saw, I'd do better. If you got me a power saw, you know, I'd cut 10 pieces a minute. And then you find the, the, the guy down the line, and you find him picking up these pieces of wood that the other guy's cutting, and he's hammering pieces of wood together. And you say, what are you building? <laughs> and the guy says, I don't have the slightest idea, but I can sure drive these nails. Sometimes I can drive in with just one or two blows. Well, can you imagine? There's a house in, in uh, San Jose called the Winchester House. One of the heirs of the Winchester gun thing, this, this lady, a widow, apparently, she was kind of off, and she just kept building and building and rooms and rooms, and, and then the, the doors go in some place. What, what a mess it is. People go to see it. It's so, it's so bad. Okay. Now, uh, I want to say there are inadequate aims. For example, uh, just to keep the students quiet, you know, if you want to keep them quiet, have them play the quiet game. But is that your, your aim? Do they only learn when they're quiet? How about uh, keeping them busy? Is that an adequate aim? You know, sometimes you see all kinds of coloring books, and you see crafts, and you see all sorts of stuff. Well, that's not enough. Keep them entertained. Well, they could probably entertain them well with games and maybe even show them videos and so forth. That, that, that's not your aim. Keep them from fighting. Well, that's good. I don't think you want fights. But if you want to keep from fighting, put one in one corner, another in another corner, another corner in another corner. I doubt we have more than four in your class after you do that. But, uh, you know, that's sure we don't want them to fight. And uh, we want them to be comfortable. We want to keep them from breaking stuff, especially, you know, if they're in a... Uh, room that's going to be used as a Christian school, too. The Christian school teachers aren't going to want all the stuff broken. Another inadequate aim is just getting through the time period. <laughs> Have you ever uh, finished a Sunday school class and got, boy, I'm glad it's over? You know, that's not enough just to get through the time period. I mentioned applause. I doubt whether you're going to get much applause. And, and, and really, you know, I really feel like memorizing the scripture is very important and we ought to do some memory work in Sunday school but just to have them say it letter for letter perfect that ought to not be the ultimate aim it's nice for them to sing well but really that's not your ultimate aim I doubt to teach them harmony and so forth unless it was a, a music class uh, artwork or crafts uh, uh, <laughs> It's not adequate just to, you know, build a nice birdhouse or whatever you're doing. But the, 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 the question is, what did they learn? You know, what are they to do? Now, this particular slide, and by the way, if you're taking notes, uh, or it's in the book there, but let me just say this. Of all the things I'm saying, the next two slides are the most important of all. What is a teaching aim? Well, I'm going to give you a sentence that I believe is very important. A teaching aim is a clear statement of what we hope to accomplish by teaching the lesson. This is so important, I'm going to repeat it. A teaching aim is a clear statement of what we hope to accomplish by teaching the lesson. Before you teach, you ought to have an aim that's as clear as this target. You have a bullseye. You have something that you want to accomplish as a result of the lesson. And I say write it down. Now, I know Sunday school work is a lot of volunteers, but I really think it would be great if your Sunday school teacher or superintendent would come into your class, ask for your lesson plan, and ask to see your aim and objective. In other words, what are you going to accomplish? What are you trying to accomplish as a result of your lesson? And until you write it down, it may not be, may not be clear in your mind. Now, the second slide, which I think is probably equally important, and that is how... How do you determine your aims? Now, one of the things that will help you is three questions. The first question is this. What do I want my students to know as a result of this lesson? 
when they leave that class, these students are going to know this. You've written it down. They know number one. They know number two. They know number three if you got three points in your lesson. If you got seven points, one, two, three, four, five. You've written it down. And unless they know what you want them to know, then you have not hit the target. Okay? But you've got to write it down. You've got to know what you want them to know. That's number one. And, and I think knowledge is important. Okay, number two, what do I want my students to feel as a result of this lesson? Now, the feeling, it's one thing to know, but it's another thing to feel and understand. What I'm talking about here is what convictions do you want them to have? I personally believe that we ought to have some convictions. We ought to have some Bible convictions. We, a conviction to me is something you hold so strongly that you'd rather die than give it up. I'm talking about things like morality. You know, we need to put that not just in a head knowledge, thou shalt not commit adultery or flee fornication, but they ought to feel it. They ought to have it in their hearts. Okay? So feeling. What do I want my students to feel? Not just know it, but feel it. And then the third thing, what do I want my students to do? You see, it's not, it's not what students know. It's what they become that really counts. You want the students not just to know and feel something. You want them to do some things differently than they have ever done before. Or maybe quit doing some things that they've done. So what do I want my students to know? What do I want my students to feel? And then... What changes in their lives? What do you want them to do as a result of their teaching? Okay, now, let me just talk about that. Solomon, and I'm just reading Proverbs again now in the bread program. Solomon talked a lot about knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. With all thy getting, get wisdom. And with thy getting, get understanding. You've heard that, haven't you, many times. Let me illustrate this. Uh, on, the front of your, on the front of your car or your truck, there probably is a gauge, a circular gauge that looks about like this. Okay? Now, on that circle, on that circle, if I was to draw that here, on that circle, there's a letter E. On the other side, there's a letter F. The E is on this side, the F is on this side. How many have ever seen that? Now, if you drive, I hope you, hope you have ever seen that. Okay. Now, if the E is over there, and this is the arrow, when it's here, it says it's full, but what, what do you know? What do you know what is pointing here toward the E? Knowledge tells you it's empty. That's factual knowledge. I think everybody who drives ought to have that knowledge. Really, very important. But it's more important than this knowing that the E means empty. Hopefully, you understand something. And what do you understand? The significance of that E. That means that you're, what's the E stand for? That means that your tank is almost empty. And you understand, you understand that pretty soon what's going to happen. <coughs> and you stop, right? That's understanding. How many of you drive a car understand that? Good. Good. Okay. Now, what's wisdom tell you to do? <laughs> it means to the very first chance you get, even if the price is higher than you normally buy, you're going to get put some gas in. There's a difference between knowledge and understanding and wisdom. We want our students to know some things. We want them to understand some things. We want them to do some things. 
That's the thing you write down. So write on your lesson plan. On your lesson plan, write down these things my students are going to know as a result of this lesson. Harder to write down, but write it down. These students are going to feel this when they leave this class. And then thirdly, these students are going to do the following when they leave this class. Now, I hate to ask you this, but how many of you are teaching and are not writing down your aims and lessons? I would dare say that many are teaching and are not writing down their aims objectives. And if you don't know what the target is, how are the students going to know what the target is? Okay, now, the nature of the aim. The nature of aim, when you have an aim, it helps you to see what you want to do and direct your activity to accomplish it. I'm going to make a statement. I think is very true. A vague lesson aim will result in vague teaching. In other words, if you, if you say, well, my aim is for them when they leave this class to know something about the Bible. Well, that's good, but that's pretty vague. What do you want them to know? Or maybe you're your uh, aim is, my aim today, uh, doing, I want them to let their light shine. Well, what do they know? What's a light? How do they, you know, the students, what, 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 how do they let know their light shine? You know, many people wouldn't have the slightest idea what that meant. Wouldn't know how to make their light shine. That's what I call vague. It's general. It's not, it's like, it's like th throwing darts and having the whole wall, whole wall, all the walls is your target. You know, you're not going to, it's not very specific if it's just anything you throw out about the Bible. So specifically, what do you want them to know as a result of your teaching? And if you're not specific, if it's just general, it's vague, and your teaching is going to be vague, and the students are going to leave not knowing anything particular and specific and they're not going to feel anything in specific and they're not going to do anything in specific because you have not had a clear-cut statement of what you hope your students are going to accomplish and what they're going to know and what they're going to feel and do. Now, the nature of the aim. The clearer the aim, the better the chance is, or the means to accomplish it, when you know specifically what your target is, you've got a much better chance of accomplishing it. If you're playing golf and don't know which hole you're playing, and you just tee off, well, you're not going to get in the right hole in the fewest stroke. That's just not clear cut. That's vague. I believe this personally. I believe that teaching without aims Clear-cut aims is probably the greatest weakness in teaching. We have a book in the back called Teaching with Variety. It's a result of teaching this in Bible schools for many years. My wife and I have taught teacher training some 30 years. What we do in, the, in what we taught teacher training was we taught them a method, and then every student had to teach using that method. So we have observed thousands of people teach. And I would say that of one of the two most important things that are neglected, that the greatest weaknesses are teaching without aims. You can spot it when a person stands up there, whether they have an aim or not. Okay? That's a great weakness. The other second greatest weakness is lack of preparation, and that we won't have time to cover. Now, let's talk about purposes of aims. What aims are going to do for your teaching is aims are going to give you direction. They're going to just going to give you a plan. You know, you know where you're going, so it gives you direction. Okay, number two, teaching helps to avoid rambling. Have you ever heard a teacher or a preacher start rambling? 
Anybody ever heard a teacher ramble? Have any of you ever rambled? There are not many of you admitting it. I heard a preacher, and I won't tell you where or how long ago or who it was, but he was preaching a sermon, and he started talking about steakhouses. And he started talking about all the steakhouses he'd been to, the various steakhouses, and so how good the steak was. And after about seven minutes, at least it seemed that long, he finally said, why am I talking about steakhouses? It had absolutely nothing to do with his lesson. Now, we're going to, in this Idea Fest, we're going to have a lot of ideas presented, hopefully. I know in our sessions we're going to give you a bunch of different teaching methods and different ideas, and I saw that some of the other sessions look real good. I'd like to go to some of them. You're going to have a lot of methods. Well, how do you choose what methods? How do you choose what materials? How do you choose what activities? The, the aim will help you choose this. Let me give an example. Supposing your aim, as far as knowledge is concerned, would be to teach the five books of the Bible, and it's a clear aim you have, five, first five books of the Bible, in order, correctly spelled. Okay, that's your specific aim. When they leave this class, they're going to know the first five books of the Bible. They're going to know how to spell them, and they're going to know in what order. Now, how would that affect your teaching methods, materials, and so forth when you teach that class, if that was your aim? Anybody? Okay, that, that would help. Music, certainly you can use it. Okay. Okay, it's using flashcards. All right. All right. Somebody else. Use the Bible, okay? You get to the very front, front page of the Bible where it lists those. All right, that'd be helpful. Somebody else. Okay, I'm talking about what? Methods you use, what materials you use, what activities. Now, all these things that I have heard are good, but not one of them. My, one of my aims was that they would know correctly spelled. Now, you sing a song, you could have, you could have, you know, the order correctly. Uh, go to the front of the book, and they may read it, but you may not know whether they've learned how to spell it, and so forth. So, what would you do? Okay. Okay, these are some good ideas. Let me show you something that won't, won't necessarily work. You call one student at the front, and you say, okay, I want, Johnny, I want you to recite the first five books in order. And Johnny says, Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, and Lexus. Well, what did you learn? Well, you learned at least he knew how many of them. You, he knew Genesis, Exodus, and Deuteronomy, didn't he? So he did learn three of the five. You're partway there. But you learned, he didn't know Leviticus, did he? And he left out numbers. But what else don't you get by them just standing up there? Huh? Don't know whether they can spell or not. Now, I think your methods of scrambling letters and so forth, but, you know, to me, one of the simplest things you could bring there is some paper and some pencils and then give them a little quiz at the end or in the middle and find out whether they know them. You see, if you call on one student, then that might be a bright student who knows it, but the others don't. It isn't your goal for everybody in that class to know what you want them to know. So if you've got a clear cut, this is what I'm to know, not just to know the first five, not just to know them in order, but know them to spell them. Okay, now I'm not saying you, that every class is a spelling test, but that was my goal. That was a clear-cut statement. That will affect, affect how I do it. Now, I might do methods. You know, some of you have, have uh, talked about holding letters up. Uh, the chalkboard's a tremendous way. You could write them on the board. You could erase letters off of there and so forth. So there's a lot of methods, but... That's one of the things.
in addition to the methods, materials, and activities, also you, you would, you know, your time allocation. You see, see right now I've got 25 minutes left. If I only had, if I only had five minutes left and I hadn't, you know, had some, some methods take a whole lot longer. Not that they're not good methods. All right, let's move on. You've got it written so we can do this. The purpose of aims and teaching. One of the things that do, if you have a goal, you know how close to the goal you've achieved. In other words, if that Johnny did three of them, you know he knows three of the five. He doesn't have them necessarily in order, and you don't know if you can spell it, but you've at least got a measurement because that's your target of what you're wanting to achieve so you can find out whether they achieve or not. You got your hand up, brother. That's right. That's one of the things that, that uh, one of the laws of teaching is review and application. Good. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, I'll just move on. Aims, aims and teaching will help the pupil make aims for himself. Somebody said a harem scarum teaching will produce harem scarum pupils. If the students don't know, if you don't have an aim, the students won't know what the aim is. It inspires the teacher. When you see a student accomplish your aims and objectives, it gives you a good feeling. That's probably why you're still teaching. I know I'm, I've been in Bible, I was in Bible college some 30 years, but what really inspires me more than anything now that I'm out is seeing the Tracy Coes and her husband Sammy Coe and the Heraldos and the Mark Hannibals and the, and the Mike and, uh, uh, Tuttle and Holland and the, the, the Philip Chulas in Belgium, you know, seeing that they're doing the things you've taught them. That inspires you that, as a teacher. And if your pupil, is living for God and doing a good work for God, consistent Christian life, that inspires you. And it inspires you even in the short range for somebody to know the things you want them to know. And hopefully you see that they feel it, they develop convictions and, and attitudes. All right, long range aims. First of all, I, I really believe that one of your goals, long range, it's a little bit vague right now, but every single student in your class, one of your long-range aims is that every one of them would be saved. That certainly is a long-range aim. Now, to reach that aim, you cannot, I doubt whether you're going to teach Acts 238 every single class. To reach the salvation aims, you may have a lesson on repentance. Before that, you might have a lesson on faith. And then you might have a lesson on water baptism. And you might... Uh, have a lesson on receiving the Holy Ghost and a lesson on living a separate life. So it's going to take more. The long-range aims is going to be broken down into short-range aims. I think another thing that we need to think about in our long-range aims is for our students to grow. It's not enough for them just to get the Holy Ghost and be a, a, a bump on a pew for 30, 40 years. We've got to instill in them that they need to not just be brought to Christ, but they need to be built up in Christ. They need to grow. We need to teach them habits of prayer, of Bible reading, and some of the methods on that. Maybe you would have a chart for them to read. I, I, there's lots of methods on that. Grow. You want them to talk about giving and a whole lot of other things that would cause them to be built up in Christ. And then lastly, and this certainly applies to the do aspect. What do I want my students to do? How can they serve? What can they do? And sometimes generalities, especially in younger children, they don't understand generalities. Where's the first place you serve God? Where's the first place you serve God? At home. We got to teach them to do some things differently at home. If you teach about thankfulness, they got to. One of the things you might have them do is go home and thank mom for the meals, thank dad for working and providing the funds, and you know some things to do. 
uh, you know, there's a lot of things. To do. So in a home, you know, clean up the room. Just just a whole lot of things to do. That's the first place to serve God, with the right attitude, you know, with a cheerful attitude. Okay? The, the, the second, the, the uh, next place, I think, to serve God is certainly in the church. Uh, and then, then there's to serve God in the community. And we need to inspire our young people to serve. They're not just get saved. They've got to serve. We're training them that they will be faithful workers propagating this gospel. Okay? And you need to suggest some opportunities. And certainly there are lots of opportunities to serve God. In your teenage uh, classes, certainly they could go and be volunteers in the hospital. You could have street meetings. You could have you know, lots of things. You could even have teenagers involved in door knocking. Oh, right. Now, how do you determine lesson aims? Well, first of all, I'd say is that probably a lot of you are using literature. You may be using the Pentecostal Publishing House literature. You may be using other literature. Now, most literature will have some aims and objectives for your lessons. And I would consider those. However, I will say this that you may need to revise that. Sometimes lessons are written two or three years in advance. Sometimes they're written by somebody who's 2,000 years, 2,000 years, 2,000 miles away. Uh, you know, and, and you may have to revise them to be more specific you know, to it. So that's one suggestion. Secondly, there is no substitute if you're teaching a Sunday school lesson or a Bible lesson. This applies to the pastors teaching a Bible culture. There's no substitute to reading that passage in the Scripture a number of times and praying. I think God can reveal to you sometimes some aims and objectives that you would have for the lesson. Not only God can, I think God will. If you'll sincerely pray, read the Scripture with an open heart. Then thirdly, uh, I think you need to consider the needs and the interests of your class. And uh, they may be different than the person had in mind who wrote the quarterly. So how do you consider the needs and interests of the class? Well, one of the things you do is you listen and observe. Sometimes you get it by just listening and observing. And you don't always get that in your classroom. Sometimes you've got to go on the playground. You can learn some things. You could see the kid who said, well, if I can't play shortstop, I'm going to take my ball and bat and go home. You know, we, 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 I'm sorry to say, we have some preachers that almost did it. They, they don't believe exactly like that. do. Take my bat and ball and go home. Well, I want to tell you that. That's selfishness. And I think I would teach on denying myself if I observed that type of, of conduct. So observe and listen. Have any of you had the privilege of uh, hearing Sister Mackey do a Sunday school seminar? Have you? She's good, isn't it? Maybe you heard this illustration. I've never forgotten when she, she did it. She said she was doing a Sunday school seminar. It was on Saturday. And during the day, they had a, a break. And uh, they stepped outside for some fresh air. And she stepped outside. And she saw the pastor's son there. And uh, the pastor's wife saw her boy and said, if you don't straighten up, when you get home, your daddy's going to give you a whipping. Now you need to straighten up, son. You understand that? And she observed that. And then the pastor's wife went into church. And you know what the little boy did? He started cursing up a streak. This is a Pentecostal pastor's son. Well, it so happened that she was asked to teach that age group in Sunday school the next day. What do you think she taught on? I'm just saying you observe and listen. And I think sometimes you can, I think God has given us children sometime. <laughs> I had a teenage boy, well, it was a three that ended up, but I, when I was teaching a teenage high school class for four years, I got a lot of my lessons by observing him. <laughs> you know, the needs that he had, probably the needs of others had too. So, so you observe and you listen. Okay, let's, let's move on to another thing. 
I think we ought to know the general characteristics of age groups. If you, if you have kindergarten kids, you don't need to talk about how to behave with the opposite sex. You know, they're, they're just treat whatever. But I want to tell you, you teach in junior high school, in high school, and you ought to know that changes are going to take place in their life. And they need to hear it from someplace other than in the public school system or someplace other than just their neighbors. Now, hopefully, the parents will teach it. But it certainly doesn't hurt for you to reinforce that with the Word of God, knowing something about the age group. And different age groups have different characteristics. And I think it would be wise for you as a teacher to know something about the general characteristics of what children that age have problems with. If you can't find it on the Internet, if you can't find it in books, why don't you go to a public school or a Christian school and talk to the teacher or maybe even observe the class there? I think teachers would be interested in having somebody who's interested in that. Go and find out what are the age characteristics of kids this particular age or young people this particular age. Now, every single thing in your lesson must fit and must help you accomplish your aim and objective. As an attention getter, I tried to start it with a target. Hopefully that fit the lesson. You know, we were talking about aims, objectives. So how you start your lesson, whether it's with an object, whether it's with a, a story, whether, whether it's a current event, or whatever it be, even your attention getter, a provoking question, must be related to help you accomplish your aim and objective. Variety. We wrote this book, Teaching with Variety. And I really believe, as variety is a spice of life, variety can be a spice of teaching. But just to have variety for variety's sake, if it doesn't help you accomplish your aims, that's not adequate. I like humor. You will see when I teach it, sometimes I use cartoons. I, ha I happen to like humor. I enjoy humor. But you know, just to tell jokes may not help you accomplish your aim at all. I remember one time I was teaching, and a joke came to my mind. Have you ever been teaching and a joke came to your mind? And I started to tell that joke. I got one word out, and immediately I recognized this has nothing to do with the lesson. Absolutely nothing. So after one word, I blurted out, I don't think the class even knew why I said that word. You two might have been in there that day. All right? But what I'm saying is, is, is if, if you have a joke and it doesn't relate, just forget it. But let's talk about songs. Now, I don't think it's a bad idea to open a class with a song. I think, uh, was it Elisha that called for a minstrel before he, he talked? I don't think, but I think it ought to relate. Now, I've seen this mistake. Class, I think it would be a good idea for a sing. Does anybody have a song? And some kid raises his hand, a birdie with a yellow bill. So all of us sing, a birdie with a yellow bill. Do you know it? Hopped up on your windowsill. There's a very few of you know it. All right. Well, if your lesson is on repentance, what does a birdie with a yellow bill have to do with that? Not a thing. Now, if your lesson was on being, teaching people to be on time and punctual, then that's one thing. That song might fit real good. So even your songs ought to help you relate, accomplish your aim and objective. Okay? Then you say, well, we have time for one more song. What would you like to sing? Have you ever seen a class that did that? And then the kid says, Father Abraham. So you think, Father Abraham had many kids. Anybody know that? 
Many kids had Father Abraham. Did that have anything to do with your lesson on repentance? Wouldn't you be better off to teach him a song on Search Me, O God, or something like that? So even your songs should relate. I don't think you ought to let the kids choose songs if it's just, if you're trying to accomplish something. They ought to, ought to relate. Uh, the visuals. Now, suppose that your lesson is on uh, honesty. So, what craft would you use? Building a birdhouse? What does building a birdhouse have to do with honesty? Maybe you could twist it some way, <laughs> pay for the pieces of wood. I guess you could figure out a way, a way to do it. But if your lesson is on creation, then, then that might be, you know, a, a worthwhile activity. But I'm trying to say is everything in your lesson, whether it be variety, whether it be attention getters, whether it be humor, whether it be visuals, Songs, activities, every single thing in your lesson helps you accomplish the aim and objective. Now, you have spent time that week. You have been praying. You have been studying. You first of all wrote down your aims and objectives. You selected some methods. You, you, have, you have just, uh, you know, you're just really enthused about it. You're better prepared than you've ever been. And how do you come to class? Well, I like to illustrate it this way. Forgive me if, if I'm a little carnal, but we used to live in Stockton, and uh, Stockton was close enough to San Francisco that it seems like all the paper wrote about was the, it was the San Francisco 49ers. Now, we've been away from there a long time. I, I'll show you how long we've been away. But they had an end an end by the name of Jerry Rice. Did any of you ever hear of Jerry Rice? Just a couple of them. And they had a quarterback by the name of, of Steve Young. I think before that his name was Joe Montana before that. But can you imagine? Can you imagine the uh, 49ers being down by four points? There are, six, there are 16 seconds left in the game. They're down by four points points. They're on their own 40-yard line. Can you imagine Steve Young getting the snap and out for the, the toss? Can you imagine Jerry Rice as the end? 16 seconds to go. Down by four points. Can you just imagine him going out for a pass like that? You think that's what he'd do? No. I mean, he would cut. He'd fake. He'd go for that. He leaps. He gets the ball. Then what does he do? Hi, Ma! Cut the ball! Hi, Ma! No, that's not his objective to impress his Ma that he has the ball. His objective is to get that ball what? Over the line, the end line. End line. And when he gets that ball... Here's 70-year-old Joe Rice right now. He goes with everything he's got to get it across. Now, how are you teaching? You ought to be teaching with a feeling of destiny. I mean, these students have got to know. I mean, it's important for them to know this. These things they need to know. Hey, if it's not important for them to know it, choose a different lesson. Get something that is you know is important for them to know that fits their age group. These students have got to feel this. I mean, not just head knowledge. They've got to have convictions on it. You don't want them to leave. Not want them to leave without convictions on it. And you want them to be changed. You want their life to be different. Oh, I really believe this. I, 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 I said it earlier. I think the greatest weakness of teaching is people do not have clear-cut aims. They don't know what their target is. I'm tempted to do something right here. I'd like for you to close your eyes, would you? And, and, and be honest. Would you, all those who will be honest with me, will you raise your hand? Those who are going to be honest with me. Only about half of you. Okay. You can be, okay. 
Okay, now the, those of you who are honest, I would like for you to raise your hand if you're not writing down your aims and objectives on your lesson plans right now. All right. All right. Thank you. You, you, you. you can open your eyes now. I appreciate your honesty. Now, I'll close your eyes right now. How many after this session, how many after this session will now write down your aims and objectives on your lesson plan? Thank you. There's a few of you. Praise God. Quite a few. Hallelujah. I think it's extremely important. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, we've got uh, three minutes. Let's just try something to try to do an aim and objective. Let's say your lesson was on the Good Samaritan, a very familiar story. How many have ever heard of Good Samaritan? All right. Now, if you were teaching on the Good Samaritan, what would you want your students to know? Somebody. About prejudice? Okay, that'd be good. Somebody else? Huh? I couldn't hear what she said. Okay, I would think that would be in the feeling category. You know, you feel. That's a feeling, compassion. And you would want them to feel compassion. That's good. Anybody else, what they want to know? Huh? Okay, do it to others as you'd have them do it to you? That's good. What was the question being answered when Jesus told that story? Who is your neighbor? Is your neighbor only the one who lives next door to you? He showed that the neighbors were anybody you came in contact with, didn't he? Okay, so that's not. That you want them to feel compassion? What do you want your students to know? Okay, we've already talked about it. What do you want them to do now? What do you want them to do as a result of your lesson? Next time they're going to church, it's raining like it was raining here about an hour before service. And you see some elderly lady with a flat tire, and she's out there. But you're on your way to church. What do you want them to do? Wave at them? Wave at her and say, Lord bless you, lady? I mean, in other words, we might have to suggest some application. Praise God. Thank you. I'm going to quit now so you have time to get to your next class. There's some good classes coming up. Brother Hadabaugh. Thank you, Brother Molenpah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Amen. I think we've got our aims and objectives.